We've already walked through the process of how a power supply is made, but that only covers the manufacturing and assembly of power supplies. Before the power supply ever reaches that stage, it can be years of research and development for one new, brand new platform to be built. This process leverages multiple floors of equipment and teams of electrical engineers to get everything right. And it's one that we got to see firsthand with a leading power supply factory that supplies Cooler Master and several of its competitors. In this factory tour, we'll be looking at radiation testing equipment, climate controlled thermal and humidity chambers, wave runners and oscilloscopes, load generators, and more. The equipment in just one of these labs totals in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Most of it is industry leading technology, but we occasionally see old reliable analog equipment, like the temperature and humidity sensor that writes to a reel that one could substitute for toilet paper in a time of need. Today, we're touring the R&D facility for power supplies and learning about how they're designed. Before that, this video is brought to you by us and our Patreon page. Aside from the GN store, one of the best ways to support our high expenditure on testing quality and equipment is to join our Patreon page. We've been posting weekly behind the scenes videos lately to update our backers on developments at GN. You can gain access to our Patreon Discord, videos featuring other team members, and patrons ask GN videos at patreon.com slash gamersnexus. The funding has been going straight into maintaining our testing quality. Learn more at the link in the description below. As stated, we previously toured the manufacturing and mid-production testing of power supplies. To queue up that video or any of the other dozens of factory tours that we've done in this series, click the factory tour playlist linked in the description below. The first step of the R&D process comes from the customer. That'd be a company like Cooler Master, EVGA, Corsair, or any number of others in the industry, just as examples. We'll keep this section short. Cooler Master's first step is to define the spec before approaching this factory for help. Internally, the company will discuss the target audience. Companies normally look at sales and gauge when they're starting to dry up for existing lines or when a competitor might be pulling sales away. And then they'll figure out the price point and the user base for the new product. This is the same time when the team might try to figure out what marketing plays it might want to make. For example, a couple years ago, Corsair made a huge deal out of its gallium nitride PFC, a small part that allowed about a two millimeter length reduction and some very minor efficiency increases in the total power supply. Cooler Master's marketing plays could include things like consideration of passive or fanless power supplies, advancements in the fan blade, passive thermal solutions that allow reduced noise, or similar iterative steps. Power supplies are well defined, so to really get creative, the manufacturers might have to approach the factory and ask for recommendations on new technology. And even then, it's tough to market a power supply. It typically takes Cooler Master or the other companies about three months to design the new product, its identity, and to outline its spec, plus an additional one to two months to add a new wattage spec for an existing power supply. We have a lot of footage from tooling factories that we can show for this part. Part of the design process includes designing the chassis. If a chassis has to be retooled, the tooling can be $7,000 to $20,000 per iteration, so it's important to get it right in one go. For perspective, tooling for a full computer case can cost upwards of $1 million USD, but it's typically a few hundred thousand dollars. Still much more expensive than a power supply case, which is relatively simple since it's just a square. In our previous tour of third-party tooling suppliers in China last year, we captured footage of how tools are made in industrial machine shops that are often grungy, but very function first. These tools eventually go into the chassis manufacturing plants, either automated or manual, where they'll make anything from network switch boxes like at Lian Li to full-on computer cases like the Cosmos at Cooler Master. As for the power supply factory, it takes two to three years on average to complete a ground up, brand new platform for a power supply and get it into production. Most power supplies though, take closer to six to eight months because the company can iterate on some already known good topology that it designed previously. The factory manager told us that power supplies aren't especially high tech, and so much of the time is spent trying to increase efficiency, decrease size, or move to simply newer, better components from third-party suppliers. Time to move into the R&D rooms. We asked how much of the design work boiled down to math versus experience, and we were told that it's all math. Electrical engineering teams are broken into individuals who specialize in very low-level parts. So you might get someone whose entire job is to specialize in the transformers or someone whose entire job is to work in signal integrity, and so on. This all gets worked out on paper before it ever gets put down in testing or trial and error. In the first R&D room, we're greeted with temperature and humidity chambers that look familiar. They're used for stress testing prototypes, and they're pretty common. 
This lab employs 20 people and hosts about 10 million NTD, New Taiwan Dollars, and equipment, or about $331,000 USD for this room alone. The temperature and humidity chambers are typically run at about 40 degrees Celsius, with humidity at about 65%. The company uses 40 degrees as its baseline because it expects the average system case ambient temperature will be 40 degrees. In our own testing, we've also found this to be true. These chambers are sometimes tested up to 95% humidity or as low as 20 to 30%, but it depends on where the power supply is intended for use. Some of these are used for UL certifications, while others are just for research and development. The power supplies that go into the thermal chambers are manually wired up with 40 to 100 K-type thermocouples. Anyone who's ever wired thermocouples and secured them onto tiny parts knows how absolutely infuriating that would be. It's not easy work. It's very slow, it's up close, it's skilled labor that requires knowledge of which parts need to be logged, and it takes forever. One skilled technician here requires about 10 hours to wire up the power supply with thermocouples up to 100 K-types on the board. We got a chance to watch one of the technicians doing all the wiring work, and we're somewhat relieved to know that there really isn't a better way to do this. Just like in our lab, thermocouples are wiry, they're entangled, and they're difficult to work with once you get past the first couple. Common points of measurement include transformers, resistors, MOSFETs, and capacitors. As for what they're checking, the factory ensures that all the parts run within the recommended specs set on the data sheet for the integrated circuit supplier. Remember, the power supply factory doesn't make the service mount devices or the other components that end up in the power supply. They instead figure out what to use and how to wire it all together. So the power supply factory has to make sure everything works as designed. The power supply has to be run in this chamber, the thermal chamber, for 48 hours during the DVT stage of development. These are tested for standby, high load PCIe 12 volt, and high total load during the 48 hour period. We spotted a water tank tucked under a desk attached to this machine by a pipe, which is a jury-rigged solution that is used for humidity control. Most tests, though, stay at 65% humidity. As for figuring out where to put the thermocouples, well, a lot of that's done later in the process, which we'll talk about later in this video, typically involving a thermal camera so you can get thermographic imaging to figure out the hot spots to just make the work a little bit easier. But we'll talk about that more later. Next to the thermal chamber is a chroma rack. This one is for Chroma 8000 SMPS auto test systems. Chroma is a brand name supplier of power supply load generators and test equipment, and it fills this factory's QC lines as well. A Chroma 61604 programmable AC source is used for the bench. Looking closely at the Model 8000 rack, we can see that they're running a lot of 12 volt loads, alongside a couple of 5 volts and 3.3 volt loads. Rather than using a real system, using a Chroma rig or a similar competing brand, allows for programmed controlled load generation for the power supply, tunable for each power supply that comes through. The power modules on the far left of the model 8491 chroma rack are 20 amps, 500 volt modules for LED driver and light testing, another service that this factory provided in the past. These racks also include oscilloscopes, thermocouple readers, and wave runner or wave surfer brand devices for logging or analyzing component performance. The thermocouple readers are wired up again with 40 to 100 probes from the power supply's internal components. Then they're logged for data analysis later. With 48 hours of data per device, there's potentially millions of lines of data to align against load generation, ambient temperature, and humidity in the charting software. Mounted to a wall is a DDC panel for a burn-in testing room that's been converted into a warehouse. The burn-in room used to be a heat-controlled environment for age simulation and longevity testing of components. It's been adapted, though, because they needed more storage space. The next room has testing equipment for power supply fans, which aren't made here, but are assembled with the power supply in this location. The fans come from a different supplier and are tested during the EVT, or the engineering stage, before progressing to the DVT stage. This lab uses a tachometer wired to a data logger, but it's not the kind of laser tack that requires a sticker, the most standard kind. Instead, it's a sensor and a wire alone that cost $1,500, and that's before the cost of the data logger that they're hooked up to. Fans are tested for the RPM range so that speeds and noise targets can be complied with later in development. The industry standard for fan RPM variance is plus or minus 10%, and that's the same here. The next room we went into showed how low level the testing procedures can get. Using a WaveSurfer 24MXSB oscilloscope, an engineer was testing the AC side bridge diode for an upcoming power supply model. 
This test looks at the inrush spike. So technicians wire up sense lines to the PCB and then turn the power supply on and off rapidly to evaluate the inrush on the oscilloscope. Depending on the spec defined for the customer or for the platform as a whole, this stage can help shape early development. As with many other factories, good old Windows XP is used on the systems for data export and analysis. You don't need anything special to pull data off of a scope. And these machines have been in service since the lab was set up with the testing equipment to begin with, and most of them aren't connected to internet. We also saw an XTEC 7450 500 volt amp dielectric analyzer for the high pot test, or high potential testing. In the factory stage later in the process, which we showed in our previous video, high pot testing is used for a high amperage and a high voltage test designed to ensure that the power supply meets the spec for the product. The factory side tests are for 1800 volts at 10 milliamps for one, or 25 amps at a lower voltage for the other. At this stage, the test runs for one minute for initial design. All of this testing, every single thing done in the lab, needs to be done against a known and logged ambient temperature and humidity. This is where that analog temperature and humidity sensor comes in. The sensor only costs 20,000 NTD, or about 662 US dollars, which is extremely cheap for lab equipment. It's been around for about a decade now, and they've never had a part fail. It uses needles to write data to a big reel, like a seismograph, and with each reel, they're able to store one month of data. If anyone has to go back to figure out what happened with a weird test result, they can unroll it and look at the analog data. As for why analog, the team told us that it's more reliable and it never needs replacing. Digital meters need replacing regularly or part fixes, and this meter never goes bad. It hasn't had defects in the years and years since it was deployed, and all tests conducted in the lab require a ambient temperature and humidity log to make sure they're valid. So if you use a meter that goes bad in the middle of testing, everything done in the lab during that period would have to be redone. The cost is too high, so they just use analog because it's reliable. Although not in use, it's kind of fun to look at some of the reserves of equipment that this lab has. They've got shelving units full of AC sources, load generators, oscilloscopes, benchtop power supplies, line leakage testers, touch current testers, and other testing equipment that's either not actively used anymore or is redundant for failures. The next room had even more testing equipment. This room tests everything, even the tape that's used for transformer isolation and other tests. When the factory buys equipment, like tape, for use in its testing process, it validates that the tape works as the seller advertises. The same happens for thermocouples. It has to make sure they work and that they're calibrated with typically an ice bath. It seems the approach is to trust nobody, as any bad link in the chain could cost millions in damage if product development goes wrong. The test rig shown here tests the tape by pinching the tape between two rods and attempting to pass electricity through it. If anything makes it through beyond the spec, the tape reel fails and the tape is returned. The next table is more familiar to us. These are test benches for real-world benchmarking, featuring applications like Furmark, Unigen Valley, Final Fantasy Stormblood, of all things, and 3D Mark applications. These tests are to check for coil wine and power supplies, but also to check for OCP and other protections to see that they work as intended in a real-world environment. The factory insists that power supplies shouldn't affect coil wine coming out of the motherboard, the GPU, or other components on the board, and that they only test for power supply noise. If a power supply does exhibit coil wine, which is the result of coils vibrating within the inductor shell, the factory can add extra costs and steps by gluing the coils to stop the high-frequency vibrations from creating the irritating noise. Continuing to the next floor up, we were faced with even more testing equipment. These acrylic chambers are small thermal test environments for power supplies. They're a lot less sophisticated than the others, but since the other chambers are so financially and spatially expensive, and time expensive to use, these are needed to ensure no time restrictions in testing. These chambers are done the old-fashioned way. They use light bulbs in the bottom to heat up the chamber to about 1500 watts. These are used for the EVT or the engineering stage of development, while the more elaborate chambers are used for the DVT stage of development. These chambers have been through enough torture that the acrylic is starting to show signs of age from the rapid heating and cooling cycles, but they're still useful. The power supply is seated on a shelf inside of the chamber, while a fan at the bottom is used to simply circulate the air within the test environment. This room is where most of the engineers involved in the earliest stages of the pipeline end up working, which is made obvious by the rows upon rows of bins of small surface mount components. It's also in this room that the engineers help prepare the thermocouple wiring 
that's done later by technicians. Using thermographic imagers, the engineers identify hot spots on the power supply, and then they wire J-type thermocouples to the hottest spots for secondary measurements. This data is saved for later stages where the power supply gets wired for the thermal chamber that we saw earlier in this video. All the thermocouples and thermal cameras are calibrated by a special team that visits on timed intervals. We're told that the equipment in this room is used to make early changes and decisions on the design. The major components for consideration are the AC in, the bridge, buck capacitors, transformers, protections like OCP, standby, and the PFC and PWM. There are 27 key components total, but this short list is what gets the most consideration in early stages. That wraps our Power Supply Factory tour for the R&D lab. If you'd like to see the physical assembly process of the same factory, you can check our factory tour playlist below. You can also watch our other factory tours, like those covering metalworking, case manufacturing, and more. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. We need the support directly from the community to fund these types of factory tours. They are not cheap adventures, but it's some of the most unique content you can get on the subject matter. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.